Welcome to the forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. My name is Sharon Begley. I'm the senior <coughs> science writer at STAT and your moderator for today's event. Our topic today is one that should be of interest to anyone who has been a patient, is a patient, or will be a patient. In other words, everyone. Um, <laughs> the topic is diagnostic tests, inaccuracies, risks, and the, public health's, the public's health. It's an hour long and is a collaboration between the forum here and STAT. Today's panelists, starting on my immediate right, are Aaron Kesselheim, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law at Brigman Women's Hospital. Next, we have Alberto Gutierrez, Director of the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiological Health at the Center of Devices and Radiological Health at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Next, Rami Arnaud, assistant, assistant Professor of Pathology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. He's also the Associate Director of the Clinical Microbiology Labs at Beth Israel and former Director of Reference Lab Testing at Beth Israel. Last but not least, Lucien Leap, member of the Institute of Medicine's Quality of Care in America Committee. He's also an adjunct professor here at Harvard Chan and a pioneer in patient safety. Our program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to theforum at hsph.harvard.edu. And you can also participate in a live chat discussion that's happening on the forum website right now. Um, Aaron, I'm going to turn to you to get us started. The, the term medical tests applies to all sorts of diagnostics and, and, and diagnostics, and we'll talk about a range of them, um, as well as how this fits into patient safety. If you could first um, talk about an increasingly popular class of tests, they're called laboratory developed tests or LDTs. Um, and the reason we're starting with them is that the FDA recently raised concerns about them in a report. Um, if you could explain to us a little bit about what they are and why they're engendering such controversy. Sure, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of this, this panel. So, so laboratory developed tests or LDTs um, such as in vitro diagnostics are, are tests that are developed by individual laboratories and are intended to be used by local clinicians. And um, in recent years, they have been sort of on the vanguard of a lot of innovation in the field of, of diagnostics, include, and, and have been, um, you know, so we've seen an explosion in these laboratory developed tests that are used in the diagnosis of rare diseases to identify public health threats such as HIV, to help push forward precision medicine. So there are like tens of thousands right now um, of diagnostic tests, including the majority of, of genetic tests out there, are actually um, available as LDTs or laboratory developed tests. And they're to be distinguished from um, uh, uh, tests that are approved and sold by uh, device manufacturers to um, many different laboratories around the country. But recently, however, several of these tests have been associated with, with um, serious safety issues, and increasingly complex laboratory-developed tests are being marketed by these medical centers and other standalone laboratories for use in broad patient populations. And so um, this combination has uh, increased the concern that, the, that some of these tests might be uh, might be problematic. And so the FDA actually recently released a series of case examples of, of tests um, that are problematic, including, for example, a test that was um, intended to try to identify women at a high risk of ovarian carcinoma, um, despite evidence from a study run at NCI that the test had poor predictive value. Um, and in this case, you know, a false positive test might lead a woman to consider doing a, um, an unnecessary oophorectomy or surgery, uh, uh, you know, to try to reduce their risk. Um, so after an FDA warning for this particular test, the, the, the device was removed from the market. Um, there's also been a lot of controversy in particular about a, a company called Theranos, a seemingly, that, which has been um, uh, putting out a, a seemingly disruptive um, a set of, of blood tests, um, of which one of which the FDA uh, has approved, uh, but has been widely promoting a bunch of tests across a number of different diseases without any clinical validation that we know about. Um, so the secrecy around this company and its testing platform have been quite quite atypical. And anyway, as a result, there's been a lot of discussion about how the regulatory system can ensure patient safety in high quality diagnostics while still allowing sufficient pathways for innovation in this field. So just to quickly um, provide some of the, the, the sort of setup here, um, 
uh, in the wake of some public concerns about diagnostic tests in the 1980s, Congress passed um, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments Act, or CLIA, um, which directs CMS to set standards and review the analytic validity of tests. Meanwhile, the FDA has authority to review um, diagnostic tests under the Medical Device Amendments Act, uh, and when the FDA reviews the tests, it tends to review um, the clinical validity of the test, which is the, basically the accuracy which with the, which with the test can, act, can measure the clinical condition that it is intended to try to measure. And so this distinction between analytic and clinical validity, I think, is going to be you know, sort of critical to the discussion today. So um, you know, basically, a test can be analytically valid, um, but still fail to accurately predict or diagnose a clinically relevant condition. And that obviously has um, important public health implications. So the FDA, and tr to try to solve this issue, the FDA recently proposed a new framework to, tr to try to evaluate laboratory tests. And so I have a slide um, that shows this new proposed framework diagrammatically um, that basically tries to scale the risks of the test based on, uh, and then uh, uh, adapt the amount of um, oversight to that risk. So a laboratory, uh, laboratory developed test for a rare disease uh, or for one that meets an unmet medical need would still be largely exempt from FDA review. Um, but if otherwise, if the test is a, is a high risk test or a moderate risk test, um, then it could be subject to some level of, uh, of validation and review by the FDA, either through the PMA process, um, which is used for the highest risk uh, devices, or, or through the 510K process in which your device only has to be substantially equivalent to a um, a previously marketed device. Anyway, um, this is one uh, proposal that's being put out there to reconsider the way that laboratory developed tests are regulated. Other proposals include um, taking authority out of the hands of the FDA altogether um, or, and, uh, or replacing it with a patchwork of, uh, of oversight from states and CMS and, and FDA, neither of which provide the same level of, of potential oversight that, that this sort of a, a, that the, uh, an FDA regulated structure might provide. So as you mentioned, the in inaccurate medical tests can have s serious consequences for patients. Um, I want to show a brief video clip. Um, it was produced by the uh, New England Center for Investigative Reporting. It's about a couple who did receive an erroneous prenatal test result. So if we could show that, please. <laughs> Uh, this new test, brand new test, 99% accurate, and I thought it was just Down syndrome. I didn't know about the others. And I was here working, <laughs> and they called with the results. And the minute she answered, it was the doctor, not the nurse, not the midwife. So I stopped right there. I was like, mm. And then she said, where are you? And I just knew it was bad news because they'd never ask you where you are if they're giving you good news. And then she said the baby tested positive for T18, trisomy 18. Just, you know, the mortality rate is high and even if the, most of them are still born and then if they do survive, it's not more than a few days, even hours, and they can't breathe, they, su they suffer to get breath, and I just was like hysterical, totally hysterical. And then I called him, he was hysterical in the airport, you were crying your eyes out. Because before I got off the phone, I said, can you tell me the gender, and she told me it was a boy. And he wanted a boy so bad, and he was, I just remember you crying, saying, it's a boy, it's a boy. And then I read a story about one woman who went, didn't want to, terminate and went through and gave birth and then she said I wish I never did that because the baby suffered so badly so when we talked about that we're like we don't want to put baby through that you know and then she said it's such a new test there could have been an error in the lab that's what I remember her saying she's like just let's just wait so when I say I have mixed emotions I'm I mean I'm thrilled she of course she's our hero because she convinced us to wait but yet, knowing now what I know about the test, had they explained the test a little bit beforehand, we wouldn't have to be been so traumatized. It didn't have to be like that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's the part that I'm, it's like I have a love-hate for the doctor, to be honest with you. 
So a very dramatic example of the emotional roller coaster that uh, an, an inaccurate test result can send um, people down. Um, Aaron mentioned the, um, the FDA reports. I want to turn to Alberto now to tell us more about it. And I have to say, I'm torn, Alberto, between um, suggesting that people read it for themselves to become better informed patients and thinking, no, do not read this. You will never let your doctor order another test for you. So um, if, if you could tell us maybe um, what, what inspired it, why did the FDA undertake this? Um, and what I thought was so um, compelling and useful about the report was that um, it was done as uh, largely a series of case studies. Um, s s tell us what you guys learned. So. Um, in reality, the, the report is the combination of about 25 years of following what was going on. Uh, the FDA's law uh, to regulate in vitro diagnostic tests passed in 1976, and early on, we made a determination that there were certain tests that were uh, created typically in hospital laboratories or academic laboratories where the pathologist was working on the clinical case that likely did not need our overview. And so we we decided not to uh, regulate those tests. And in the mid-90s or so, we saw a shift uh, from uh, both laboratories uh, becoming kind of more of a service, just providing results to physicians. And with the ability to ship, to ship samples all around the country, we also saw a shift of, of laboratories uh, not necessarily being uh, near the patient or, or forming part of the patient uh, um, uh, uh, treatment. Um, with that, we also began to see laboratories that were just like the one for the test that was on the, on, on the clip, laboratories that were created to provide one test and marketed all over the country uh, with claims that were, were done by the company, essentially. And so we began to try to, to uh, move uh, to regulate this field. We began doing so really in the late 90s in, and, and have, have proposed several uh, ways to move forward. It, in combination, in 2010, we said, okay, we're going to regulate it the way we regulate everything else, and we put a draft proposal in 2014 that, that it, to a certain extent, is what Aaron uh, uh, showed. Um, so the idea is to, uh, to br br bring laboratory-developed tests on the same, uh, the same paradigm, if you like, as we regulate all the, and that is to be able to, to look in the pre-market to look at the claims they're making and to, to determine whether they are clinically valid or not. The, the example in the clip is a good one because it's not only a co company that set up uh, and that marketed, uh, and that had marketed up really erroneously because the test is actually a very good test as a screening test. And it should be a screening test. Uh, it, it's much better than, than the way we used to do prenatal screening. But the fact is, that because of the prevalence of the disease and because no test is perfect, you are going to get false results. And as the prevalence drops, that, that the number of false positives is going to increase. So the fact that the company was selling this as extremely accurate and not telling people beforehand that when they got a positive result, it was unlikely to be actually a positive result, particularly for, for trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. Those are the, thing, the kind of things that we want to be able to regulate and, and have companies hold them responsible for making claims that are appropriate for what they have. So, so the second part of our discussion will look at solutions to the kinds of challenges that you're all outlining. I just want to be sure um, that we all understand what the current um, landscape is. I think when most people undergo tests, certainly when they undergo treatment, whether it's with a pharmaceutical, a device, whatever, um, they believe that this has been vetted by federal <coughs> regulators. So does the FDA currently have the statutory and or regulatory power to look at LDTs and the other kind of tests So we're we think about? we do. Uh, if you look at the 1976 statute, it does not in any, uh, it, it talks about the type of test or the type in vitro reagents, the type of things that we do regulate. It does not limit us to regulating them based on where they are made. Um, so we believe that we have the, the, that we actually do. And that is the reason that we're going through a guidance process. Uh, it, you know, the laboratories are fairly upset and they claim that we, one, we don't have the, the, 
the, uh, the purview over laboratories, and two, that we probably should have done this through rulemaking because we are uh, uh, imposing new regulations on them. It, it, as it turns out, it really was a policy decision back there. It's a policy decision that has been exploited to a certain extent. Um, and we do think that doing it through guidance is probably the best thing to do. I and mean, in, in part is because when you're doing regulation, uh, things that go into law, things that, that are go in the regulation itself are typically very difficult to change. This is an area that is going to be difficult to regulate. There is a broad uh, set of tests. Some of them are very good. Some of them require a lot of expertise from, from the pathologist. Some of them don't. Um, and, and regulating them in a way that makes sense, that does not disrupt what's going on, is going to be difficult. And so doing it through guidance allows us to actually try to step in, into an area in a way that we will be able to, to begin to bring them into an era where a third party will be looking at their clinical validity, will be probably pushing better on the quality systems and the reporting of uh, uh, what they're reporting um, without hopefully um, uh, stopping a lot of very good work that is going on. Okay. Um, so we've been focusing mostly on um, lab tests, especially LDTs, but that's not, that doesn't account for the entire universe of um, diagnostic tests. Um, Rami, um, you were a senior author of a paper that looked at blood tests, blood tests um, going back for 15 years' worth of data. Um, tell us what you all found. Sure. So uh, the blood tests and urine tests, the short story is that we found that we do a pretty good job, but several surprises and lots of room for improvement. So lab testing usually tends to fly under the radar, and this is kind of interesting to us in laboratory medicine because just by virtue of numbers, lab testing is the single highest volume medical activity. If you take all of the patient visits and all of the surgeries and all of the prescriptions, everything else, and add them all together, it's still not as many as the number of lab tests that are done each year. The other interesting thing about lab tests that goes to you know, why we did this study is that all of those tests, and we're talking 10 billion laboratory tests that will have been performed in the United States this year, 10 billion, is that all of those 10 billion tests taken together still only account for something like five or seven cents on the healthcare dollar. So in addition to being the single highest volume medical activity, laboratory testing has the possibility of being also the single most cost effective activity in medicine. And so it was interesting to us to ask, well, you know, how well we do with this. And in the context of uh, the discussion so far, it's really important to remember that of all these tests, you know, most of them aren't uh, all that exciting in terms of what we call the modality. They aren't sequencing. They aren't some big, expensive, high uh, technology. There are things that we've been doing more or less for the past several decades. Uh, but, you know, for, uh, for all that, they are very important in that they touch pretty much every part of medicine. And because we've been doing them for so long, and you know, as uh, Alberto had mentioned, as Aaron mentioned, some of these you know, are not terribly, uh, terribly complex. Uh, the, uh, when something goes wrong with a laboratory test, it's usually not in uh, the performance of the test itself. It's usually not the analytical uh, portion of the test, as, as Aaron mentioned. It's usually what happens after, the interpretation of the result, as has come up in the conversation so far. And what we think might even be more important uh, the choice of what test to order in the first place. And so that's why we looked at that in our study. And in our study, we asked, well, how well all, overall, on average, do we do at ordering laboratory tests? And so we did this 15-year systematic review and meta-analysis. It covered 1.6 million different performed tests that accounted for 46 of the 50 most commonly ordered tests in this country. And these include things like your complete blood count and your electrolytes and your liver function tests and your iron studies, things like that, things you've heard of. And what we found surprised us. Uh, first, we found that the rate of overuse, this is tests that were performed that shouldn't have been performed, averaged around 20%. So that means out of every 10 tests ordered, about two tests on average should not have been ordered. But even more surprising to us was the rate of underuse. This is the rate of tests that should have been ordered for a given patient at a given time, but weren't. And the rate there averaged over 40%. So for every, see if I can get my math right, for every three tests that were performed, an additional two tests on average should have been performed, but weren't. So we do all right, but there's a lot of room for improvement. 
So is the under and over um, testing because the, the primary care or whoever the clinician is, is making these calls on his or her own? I mean, is it a collaborative process? Where, where is, are the problems entering in this whole system? So the question that you're asking now uh, forms really one of the frontiers in laboratory medicine is to understand what we call inappropriate ordering and what to do about it. Uh, there are many individual issues that all come together into some form of a breakdown in cooperation. It's almost never, at least in our reading in our clinical experience, the case mm -hmm. of an individual person not meaning to do the right thing, and almost always not even the case of a person not knowing what the mm -hmm. general issue of what is right to do at that hospital is. It's more of a process. It's more about breakdowns mm -hmm. in process, misaligned incentives, and things like that mm -hmm. than it is about people. But what you've touched on is really one of the frontiers in laboratory medicine quality improvement and touches on patient care more broadly and has important implications for quality and safety in patient care. Um, Lucien, let me bring you, you and you of course have been a pioneer in efforts to um, improve patient safety. Um, how do lab tests fit into the overall, that overall goal and do you think that we have been making progress overall um, and how do lab tests fit into that? Well, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to, to uh, try to put this in the perspective of, of patient safety, which of course is preventing harm to patients. And overuse, I think, is a very major cost issue, uh, and it certainly puts patients through unnecessary procedures, but actually not a whole lot of people get harmed from overuse of laboratory <coughs> tests. Many more get harmed from, from the other types of misuse that we, that we engage in. Um, way back when this whole patient safety movement started, and we did the original medical practice study right here at the Harvard School of Public Health, we found that 23% of all the errors that we discovered that caused harm to patients were related to use of tests. So it was, it was a very major uh, percentage of the whole picture. Uh, only 20% were due to medication errors, for example. So uh, it's, it's big time in terms of potential for hurting people. Um, now it's, I think, very important to, for me to reemphasize what what Remy said, and that is that the actual performance of blood tests, urine tests, bacteriological tests, um, those sorts of things is incredibly accurate. Um, the, the studies have shown that the error rate in, in a blood count, a chemical determination, that sort of thing, is about two in a thousand, uh, which in the trade is called five sigma. If we could get one-tenth that rate of perfection in everything else we do in, in healthcare, we would be delighted. So. The folks in the lab do a fantastic job. It's what happens before and after that is the problem. Before, and, and there's basically three, three areas where uh, patients get hurt from misuse of testing. The first, which Remy's already alluded to, is, is the underused problem, and that is uh, your failure to get a test that you really needed. For example, the patient who comes into the emergency room with crushing chest pain and doesn't get a cardiogram. The patient who has a, uh, trouble, new onset cough and trouble breathing and some fever, who doesn't get a chest x-ray? That turns out to be a very significant fraction of the problem. Um, on the other side, um, once the test is done and accurately done, then what happens? And it turns out that a significant number of tests do not then get followed up, that, that there's not a proper response. This is largely a communication problem. The test doesn't get to the to the right doctor in a timely fashion, but sometimes it can be absolutely disastrous. Uh, if we're talking about critical test results, which is a term we use for, for a laboratory test of, of, of something in which the results make, are, make a difference in terms of treatment that can be life-saving, literally. Um, for example, um, a patient has a a potassium uh, that's, a, say, 11, a potassium of 11. That's the kind of thing that the doctor needs to know about right away. Um, if, the, if the biopsy shows a patient has cancer, the doctor needs to know about that, maybe not within minutes, but certainly within a few days, not a week or two later. And the communication of critical test results um, it causes a lot of trouble and, 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 a, lot, and a lot of harm for the, just the kind of things we can talk about. The, uh, the third area where misuse of testing causes harm is in misinterpretation of tests. 
Um, and we think in terms of x-rays, mammograms, cardiograms, and that sort of thing. And uh, there, uh, where we're talking about expert judgments, study after study over years has shown that when two very highly qualified experts make an independent judgment, such as both of them read a cardiogram or both of them read a mammogram, there is a 10 to 15 percent disagreement between them. Um, so this has potential for really significant harm. We did a study now a long time ago looking at uh, the relationship of accuracy of reading angiograms in terms of patients getting bypass surgery. And we found a 25% error, a 25 difference in reading between two, independently by two different cardiologists. And our best judgment was that somewhere between 15 and 20% got a unnecessary procedure because of the, of the misreading. So all of these together um, uh, have to do with uh, what's now lumped in what we call diagnostic error. And um, it turns out that diagnostic error is uh, the number one cause for malpractice suits. Um, and uh, the, the leading, one of the, one of the leading areas that we're working on, and just, just in the last few weeks, the Institute of Medicine has come out with a, a, an excellent report on the problem of diagnostic error, which it goes into, so if you're interested in this, it, it's a report that's really worth reading. But it deals with, with all these issues, which I think come back um, to what uh, you and Raymond were talking about. Uh, communication, yes, but what does that really mean? It really means do, are, are the clinicians and the laboratorians and the radiologists talking to one another and exchanging information so that, that it happens? I, 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 I think we have a long way to go in that. I think as patients we assume they're talking to one another, but clearly that's an assumption without much basis, it seems. Um, I want to turn um, in a minute uh, to, to drill down a little bit more <clears throat> into what some of the, what the way forward might be, what some of the solutions to the problems that you all have outlined. Um, before I do that, um, I, I'd like to show um, another uh, short clip. As Alberto mentioned, the FDA has said the agency wants to step up its oversight of LDTs in particular. Um, we have a video of Dr. Jeffrey Shuren um, from the FDA uh, speaking about this issue to the Energy and Commerce Committee of the House, I believe, um, just last month. If we could show that, please. And the real loser here is patients. Doctors and patients don't care about who makes a test. They do care that their tests are accurate, reliable, and clinically valid. Now, some labs have already been working with us, and we congratulate them for crossing that picket line. But our message and our invitation to the rest of the lab community is to put down the swords, that for the sake of our patients, it's time to end the saber rattling and said partner with us moving forward. So put down your swords. And Alberto, you referred um, in your remarks earlier to um, perhaps concerns that there would be pushback from some of the developers of LDTs who have been happily offering the tests, including nationwide. Um, what do you think is the most likely to succeed change that the FDA might make? Um, let's start with the oversight and regulation of LDTs. And when I say likely to succeed, um, you know, does something require congressional action? Because I would put that in maybe less likely to succeed. Um, is it something that you all can do um, through rulemaking, um, are you going to get sued? So um, the, the plan is to actually move forward with the guidance that we're doing. Um, are we going to get sued? Uh, I think a lot of people think we might. Uh, and that would obviously be problematic. We have been trying to work with the laboratory community. In, in reality, th there's been some advances. One of the things that we tried to do in the mid-2000s is we identified a set of tests that we're particularly concerned with. We called them, um, those were tests that were essentially done by a, uh, with proprietary data that was not published and that uh, uh, we felt that a, a third independent uh, review were needed of those. Um, the laboratories actually have come around and are in their proposals and the laboratories have made several 
uh, uh, legislative proposals to Congress. And it, uh, even the, 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 uh, the laboratories that have been most opposed to the FDA have at least uh, understood that perhaps there is uh, even uh, some set of, of tests that probably should get reviewed by the FDA. So we, we've got a long way. I think there is a, a, a consensus now that uh, tests should show that they're clinically valid before they are offered and that somebody should, should be able to independently verify that. Um, I don't think, I think the laboratories clearly think that the FDA, uh, they're afraid of the FDA, I, I understand that. And I, I do understand that if the FDA over-regulates, uh, um, there will be a problem. Um, so, so clearly um, we do have to, and we would like to get the collaboration of the laboratories because we're not gonna be able to do it uh, well, unless the laboratories actually uh, collaborate with what we're trying to do, um, we are. We do think that we'll continue down the path of a of a of a guidance. Though we are sure that they will, the laboratories and Congress will continue looking at legislative proposals. In part because if there is a legislative proposal, then uh, lawsuits and and uh, another problem. You know, once a lawsuit comes through, we it will be somewhat uncertain what we'll be able to do or not. So it's, there's, uh, there's a long road to hold. We'll, we'll see what happens. I, I do <laughs> think that though we will move towards something that is at least more regulated. Aaron, you gave us a preview of what, um, again, what the solutions, what the way forward might be. Um, do you think that guidance is going to, the uh, FDA issuing a guidance is likely to address much of the con CERN that we've been talking about? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that if there was, um, you know, better regulatory oversight, particularly of some of these high-risk tests, that, uh, you know, that would be very reassuring to me as a in practicing internist and, uh, you know, uh, who takes care of patients and, and you know, orders these tests. Um, you know, and I think that uh, there is definitely a public health need for, um, you know, trying to uh, you know, reconsider the um, environment that we're in right now with all of these, um, you know, uh, genetic tests and other and other tests that that we may not have envisioned, uh, you know, ten or twenty years ago. Currently being um, widely promoted and, and and widely sold. And I, you know, I think that um, it is kind of a natural reaction for laboratories to um, to be to become worried when they see the the FDA beginning to change um, its its regulatory posture that it's been taking and. You know, for many academic medical centers, these kinds of, of arrangements have become a major cost, uh, uh, you know, center for them. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, institutional worry about uh, about those kinds of issues. But I, you know, I think at the end of the day, everybody ultimately wants, uh, you know, to try to provide high quality care to patients. And um, and I think that the, uh, you know, laboratories, w w you know, will recognize that um, actually having um, the you know the the independent expertise that the FDA can offer um, you know as long as it is you know um, applied in a, in a judicious fashion to you know um, you know in a way that that the FDA is currently um, suggesting it would do which is to apply it in the cases of the most um, you know high risk uh, circumstances and you know perhaps there are ways that the FDA and CMS can better coordinate so to ensure that there is not you know duplicative um, requirements or over regulation of this kind and you know at the end of the day if those sorts of, of measures are taken I think ultimately that will both improve patient um, patient safety and public health and will also honestly improve innovation because there will be a pathway for physicians to recognize what a high um, you know what a high value study is and and, um, and to be able to use that study instead of the um, you know morass of, of potential studies out there that were you know, you, can, you don't have any, any signal as to what is a high value study. When a clinician orders a test, L L especially an LDT, do they generally know what its validation status is? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, not, I think, to a certain extent. And I, thi and I think that this is what, what Remy was talking about. I, mean, I think that, that consultations and discussions with experts in, in laboratory medicine can be a real benefit. And I think that we, uh, you know, we don't do that enough. Um, because uh, you know, there I think that there is a lot of misuse of tests and an unclear understanding of what a test means when it's ordered, and you know that kind of stuff is stuff that that can be addressed through better 
um, education of physicians and, and, and better teamwork uh, you know, among the various specialties. Before I turn to Remy, just let me be sure I understand one thing that you said, Alberto. Would any um, FDA guidance, et cetera, going forward apply retrospectively to stuff that's already out there being sold, being used, or just to new tests that companies want to use? So the draft guidance, and, and for us, the uh, draft guidance is a way to put a proposal on the table and get feedback. The draft guidance uh, uh, did apply to all tests out there, but what we did uh, was to, to uh, we, we proposed a nine-year um, uh, implementation so that people would have plenty of time and so that that implementation would be risk-based. So we would bring the, the tests that, that are currently the highest risk first um, and most of the tests, which most of the testing we consider moderate risk, that would come down five to nine years down the road. So the way we did it is by proposing uh, a long uh, a drawn in. Another possibility that, that one could do, uh, and, and that was in some of the uh, proposals that, it, it, you know, uh, comments that to the proposal is that you could, um, you could essentially grandfather what's there, but then shorten the, the implementation. Those are the kind of things that, you know, would. Um, so, Rami, um, nine years is a bunch of years, um, um, and while we all wish FDA well, um, is there anything that can be done um, in terms of better communication, just better um, clinical management um, where doctors meet patients? Definitely. So uh, I think yeah, to answer that question well about what can be done inside the hospital, you have to start by asking, well, what's the purpose of ordering a laboratory test or indeed any test? I mean, it's almost always to answer uh, questions of something like, are the signs and symptoms that my patient is exhibiting explained by, for example, an infection, explained by whatever it is that the test is meant to answer? And if so, what, if anything, should I do about it? And when you uh, try to cast clinical decision-making and management in those terms, you see that there are uh, different people, the patient, the physician, also the nurse, the pharmacist, who uh, are each experts on different parts of that question. So the clinician sees the patient, therefore the clinician best knows the patient and best knows the question. The laboratorian or the pathologist, the, the clinical pathologist, uh, best knows the test, including the test parameters, and is uh, trained to think and concentrate most about uh, issues of probability, the prevalence, as Alberto was saying, of a particular condition in the population, what that means for positive and negative predictive value, irrespective of that, what the sensitivity and specificity of the test are. These are all terms that, you know, we all have some, you know, passing acquaintance with in the hospital, but uh, largely fall by the wayside, I think, when we have a particular patient in front of us, and that can lead to, to errors. So that suggests right there collaboration between the clinician who's seeing the patient, the patient obviously and being at the center of this, and the laboratorian in order to help decide what the right tests are to order going in, and on the other end, uh, how to interpret those results. And interpreting those results, especially with a pharmacist or somebody from pharmacy, if one of the options on the table is, uh, uh, is pharmacotherapy, is drugs, which obviously we do a lot of. And it's not that these things don't happen in the hospital. I mean, everybody who's been to the hospital knows that this happens to some extent. It's, I think, the clarity and the, uh, the efficacy with which we have turn these kinds of issues into processes, into using all of the various interactions that we have around the hospital, increasingly uh, lens through focused on the electronic health record and various things that technology can do for us, that's kind of where we fall down and where we have the most room for improvement. So I think that letting the clinician ask the question informed by the laboratorian choosing the test that best answer that question and uh, both in, and the patient and uh, pharmacy deciding what best to do about it. Moving more toward a team-oriented approach is something that we can do best, which is something that has started actually quite uh, explicitly in a few Vanguard institutions around the country, uh, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch being two of them, but still is very much, uh, what do they say, the future is here, but very unevenly distributed. <laughs> um, 
Um, Lucy and I want to mm -hmm. ask you something. Um, before I do, I'm giving the audience um, my few minute warning. Um, um, if you want to start formulating questions, um, either to send to us online or here in the studio. Um, Lucy, what I was wondering about is, s since the um, groundbreaking um, IOM report to Air is Human, um, there have, thankfully, been um, some terrific advances in patient safety. Um, and some of those have come about through seemingly simple things, a, a checklist um, encouraging um, everyone in the OR, and not just the physicians, but nurses, to, to call a timeout if something looks like it is not going as it should. Um, I'm wondering, um, or even uh, required reporting, for, um, or not so required reporting, for things like central line infections. The hospitals don't want to be publicly shamed if they have a much higher rate of um, hospital error um, infections, et cetera, than their peers, either locally or nationally. Um, so I'm wondering if what you might um, see in terms of either public and patient engagement or anything um, th that doesn't require, you know, just hugely convoluted regulation, statute, et cetera, um, that might, you know, lead us forward here? Well, I think you, you, you've, you mentioned a couple of things that are very crucial. There's a real movement to engage patients much more in their care, and I think it's, I think it's really gathering steam. Um, we, uh, the evidence is quite clear that when patients are uh, part of the process uh, that we make better decisions. Um, and in fact, there are hospitals in this town in which patients are members of every committee in the hospital. And when that happens, the, uh, the, the process of care improves. And so I think, I think that's clearly part of it. I think what uh, Remy was talking about is even more important, and that is really uh, developing meaningful teamwork. And, and this, is, this turns out to be a fairly significant culture change. That's sort of not the way we've practiced in general. We tend to each do our thing and so forth. And so the implications of this, I think, are uh, a, little more, a little more difficult than they sound on the surface. But I, I, I really want to second uh, what he said because I think that's per very important. And I think of the patient as being a member of that team. So I, you know, my mental image is the, the responsible physician, the consulting physicians who are involved with expertise and the nurse and the patient together when you have a complex problem, sit down and talk about what needs to be done. Um, having said all that, I don't want to let us slip by uh, and say and it's all that sort of stuff because there's an awful lot we can still do with simple measures and with technology. One of the great things about the electronic medical record, unlike the human brain, is it doesn't forget things. And so it can be programmed so that uh, when a, when a f physician uh, puts in a potential diagnosis, it can come up and say, have you thought of blah. Um, it can, so we can use it for, uh, for dealing with the whole issue of overuse and underuse. And I think the, that there are a number of guidelines that, that have already been developed that can be cranked into the electronic medical record to make it easy for that to happen. With regard to one of my pets, which is the problem with, clinic, with critical test results, um, what you want there is a, an immediate and fail-safe system. And I, I don't know about the rest of you, but my cell phone beeps when Amazon sends me a package. I don't know why it can't beep when, and tell me that the potassium is 11. I mean, what, what's the big deal here? And uh, so let's get with it and just do the obvious uh, and, and take care of those kinds of things. And then also, I'm old-fashioned, I think that when uh, the pathologist finds that the patient has a diagnosis of cancer, he ought to pick up his phone and call me, the clinician, and say, let's talk about this right then. I mean, what's the big deal here? And but it doesn't happen. And so these are the issues that we need to explore at the, at the local level. And I'll drop one other little bombshell and, and be quiet, and that is this whole business about, I said, 15 percent error. So what does that say to you? It says when I have my mammogram, I'd like to have two doctors look at it, please. If I have an angiogram, I'd like to have two cardiologists look at it, please. There's not a lot of enthusiasm for that in medicine. You can see why. And the obvious answer is we can't afford it. Well, the dirty little secret is it's cheaper to do that than not to do that. Just think about the cost of the unnecessary treatment. Think of that missed pneumonia that ends up in the ICU for three weeks and look at that hospital bill 
and one malpractice suit would pay for one hell of a lot of duplicate readings. So we really need to, to look at some of these things in a serious fashion. From the point of view of the patient, and I can't quit without saying, when you said nine years, I said, wow. What would that couple who we saw think when you said that? And how many more couples like that will have that problem before the nine years is up? I'm sorry, nine years is not acceptable. Um, since you brought up the question of money, um, let me just ask Remy one more thing before we turn to audience questions. So clinicians um, certainly have the best interests of their patients at heart. Everybody's trying. Um, but as we've seen in other areas of medicine, sometimes you have to get the price signals right or the reimbursement signals right or whatever to um, induce um, a practice that is better for patients. Um, do you see anything um, in that sort of area of the world, just m price signals or money signals, whatever, um, that might um, help with uh, lab test accuracy, et cetera? So definitely. So there are two related issues. And I should, uh, I'd like to begin just by seconding and saying here, here to everything that Lucian just talked about. I, I think this is uh, at the heart of the matter. But the two related issues are uh, what the economists call internalizing the externalities. In other words, kind of looking at things as a whole. Uh, so similarly to the example that Lucian gave, we can imagine a thought experiment where you as a pathology department, you're now uh, you know, the head of the pathology department or laboratory medicine division in control of your budget, which, uh, in which it costs you money anytime you do a laboratory test. And we can say, all right, well, you know, uh, there are these two tests that uh, ought to be uh, not to be performed and these four additional tests that ought to be performed and so net if you correct this overuse and underuse that on average takes place in the department again just as a thought experiment you're doing more testing well more testing takes you into the red uh, however what does that testing accomplish by virtue of it being the right test for the right patient at the right time the definition of that is that it helps the patient and if you wish to put aside all manner of you know um, human kindness and just think purely as a, as a bean counter, uh, that translates to uh, less additional costs, fewer lawsuits, l shorter length of stay. Lengths, lengths of stay which are measured in the many thousands of dollars, whereas the lab test measured in the you know, tens, maybe a hundred dollars. So where does that leave us in this thought experiment? It leaves us in a world where uh, after having right-sided all of these tests, not order the tests that shouldn't have been ordered and order the tests uh, that hadn't been ordered that should have, you end up, oh pathologist, in the red for your department. And that's even worse for you because while you're in the red and being chewed out by the front office, the front office and the other departments are being patted on the back at laudatory celebrations because they have just done so much better and are demonstrating improved patient outcomes, improved patient care, and being in the black. So why can't pathology just kind of you know, get on board and do what all the rest of the hospitals? And then obviously it's because you know, that money that was saved uh, was saved because of improving pathology uh, ordering. So it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit the old, uh, the old nursery rhyme, you know, for one of an ill, the war was lost. So pathology, laboratory testing, and diagnostics in general, relative to everything that comes after, is the nail. So that's one thing that one can do, is to recognize that all that stuff goes together. The second and related issue is to say, all right, we now want these budgets to go together. We want to uh, improve ordering, right? That's what started this thought experiment. Well, how are we going to go through all of the various, what is it, 4,000 different commonly ordered tests and I think 10,000 ICD-9 codes, and I don't know how many ICD-10 codes, but many multiples. You can imagine that there's, uh, and all of these can be ordered in combination for various things. This is a lot of work to go through and figure out what ought to be ordered to come up with the rules that ought to go into clinical decision support, as Dr. Uh, Leap mentioned, in order to let the computer flash up to the physician what ought to be ordered, what not ought to be ordered. Who's going to do that work? Well, it's got to be somebody with medical training, all right? So now it's an MD, one of the MDs that you, again, and the unenviable position of running a pathology department are paying in order to you know, look at biopsies and run tests. Uh, how can you get reimbursable activity? Uh, how can you get that activity recognized as reimbursable in some way? That's the second and related issue. So I would say that those two things would help. I have so many more questions, but we're gonna turn first to our online audience. Um, Lisa, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'll start with this one. 
all of this is very concerning. Is there a way to find out more information on how many or which tests are more prone to produce false positives or false negatives? For example, isn't the false positive rate for ovarian cancer tests especially high? It would be very helpful for patients to have more information about that when making medical decisions. So um, part of the problem that we have uh, in, in laboratory testing in general, but L LDTs in particular, is that um, the performance of the tests really matter as to what decisions you're going to make and how that performance is both done and, and advertised, if you'd like. There, it, uh, it, it's not very well done. There's, not a, there's a lack of transparency, in, uh, particularly with laboratory-developed tests, but in general in the laboratory. Um, that is one of the advantages of coming through the agency. Uh, when we review a new test, we, act, we, we put on the website all the performance characteristics, what tests were done and, and how well it performs. And when there are uh, uh, either uh, poor performance, or not test is perfect, or areas where you, where you have uh, uh, a fair amount of concern, that goes in the labeling, and we have many times even put black boxes into labeling. Uh, there's a, a, a test, actually, an ovarian uh, uh, test, a test that is done on women who uh, have a mass and, and are going to be sent. Uh, uh, it, the, the question is whether this should be sent to an oncologist for the person to be done or, or not need, don't need to be done. That test, when we looked at it, there was, a, uh, there was some concern that it wasn't going to be used properly. We put a warning la label on the test so it is used uh, appropriately. Uh, so that's the kind of, of value that the agency adds. Uh, but in general, it is very difficult to get the information of, of how tests work, particularly for our laboratory developed tests. But wait, if I'm the person getting that test, do I see the black box warning or so just the clinician? That, that always has been one of our problems, <laughs> uh, is that, that, that labeling itself, at least the label, the labeling and or everything about the test is in the internet. Okay. You can actually find it. Um, but one of the problems that we have when we label, when we use labeling as a mitigation, is that lots of times that label only goes to the laboratorian and doesn't necessarily even go to the physician. Um, that is a problem of, of how we do things. So. The scene of the above. Yeah. <laughs> um, another. That's, that's very Online interesting. Question, I mean, this is a related question that someone else has sent in. Um, which is, what questions should we ask our doctors to be sure that any tests they order are being accurately reviewed? I mean, we touched on some of this. What can patients do to be more proactive in this case? So should a patient be asking to see the label? I mean, could you offer so, some advice? So in the, in the, for example, in screening tests, like for the ovarian cancer or for the non-invasive prenatal test, you should ask the doctor, you know, what is the positive predictive value? And they should be able to tell you in a way that is significant to you. So for example, for the non-invasive pre-screen uh, test for Down syndrome, typically the positive predictive value is 80%. That is, out of 10 positives, eight are right and two are wrong, okay? For, for the other trisomies, the 18 or the, or the 13, and if it is in a, a done in a population, pregnancy of low risk, that value can be, the, the doctor actually can't tell you whether one out of 10 tests are right or nine out of 10 te tests is right. But at least you know that a positive, it could be really wrong or it could not be. If it's presented in that way, you would know that you really do need to do follow-up testing because that test makes you probable for the, the, the pregnancy, you know, that, that the fetus has tried, but it's not certain in any, in, in any event. So I would say, I would just add to that, I mean, I think to, to sort of, you know, make it more straightforward for patients, you could ask two questions. You could ask why and what. You could ask why are we getting the test? And then you could ask what are we going to do with the test when the, when the test comes back? And okay. so, you know, if you, if you start that conversation with your physician, then you can start to dig into a lot of the issues that, that you were talking about. Yep. And I'll second that from the laboratorian's perspective. That couldn't have said it better. We have just Thank a few you. more minutes. Do we have time for another online question? Um, or? Yes, we do, and uh, maybe we can take one from the audience as well. I know this, this came up earlier as, as well, but what do you think about Theranos and the ability to test for hundreds of conditions with just a few pricks of blood? 
Is this as accurate as traditional blood test, and isn't the FDA finding some issues with the process, which I know we talked about a little bit, but. Who wants to take that? <laughs> so I guess I'll start, just because I, <laughs> I mentioned Theranos in my original comments, but <laughs> yeah, so you know, Theranos is a kind of a conundrum. Uh, you know, um, they have one uh, test that's been reviewed by the FDA, um, and a whole bunch of other tests that have not, and there's you know very little information that they've disseminated about how they do their tests or what's or what their um, you know what the validity of their tests are. So you know from a clinician's point of view, uh, you know I'm very skeptical about this. You know, and obviously uh, I'm not a venture capitalist, but the venture capitalists appear to be less skeptical. Um, but uh, you know I think that the fact that they are um, that they have not subjected a lot of their methods to um, peer review and, and um, transparency and, and scrutiny by, um, by, by experts in the field, you know, I think is a, is a concerning sign. And, you know, hey, maybe, maybe these things are coming. But, uh, you know, at this point, it's still, um, it's still, very, uh, it's still very theoretical. Beth, could I make a comment? Um, I, I agree completely with what you say, but it's the future. And it's going to come. I mean, what the problem is, Theranos hasn't done it right, and the FDA hasn't been on top of them like it should be, or whatever. But that's clearly the way we're going. And sometime, I don't know if it's two years or ten years, we're going to be able to do that. And it's going to be wonderful because we'll be able to get 25 different tests off a little tiny bit of blood for 35 cents or whatever. And then you're going to have an overuse problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, may, may I also, or shall we go to a question from the audience? So it's uh, almost like there are two separate things here, right? I mean, on the one hand, uh, who would be against doing more with less, doing it more cheaply, doing away with a big needle and being able to replace that with a, a prick, uh, a pinprick of, of blood? Uh, all of those things are great. Uh, has uh, and Theranos is going in that direction, but have they, but it's everything that comes after and the implementation of it that I think is, has led to the trouble with uh, that company and how it's, uh, certainly how it's perceived. Uh, I think nature abhors a vacuum mm -hmm. and the vacuum of information from them about what tests they do and can and can't do has been filled not only by a lot of skepticism uh, within the walls of the hospital, but more recently by uh, a number of investigative articles in places like the Wall Street Journal uh, that suggest that uh, in a variety of ways, uh, you know, Theranos is not uh, done necessarily what we expect. But I think that's a second and very different thing. The doing more with less, the being able to, uh, to know everything that is knowable from as small a sample as possible, that is definitely the future. Is Theranos done it right or not? That's a, an entirely different question. And I would add not only pricing, but open pricing so the patient knows what they're going to be paying for. Mm -hmm. All that is, is you know, quite uh, one would love to have that. Thank you. I don't know if you, maybe we should wrap up because yeah, we're um, short on time. The, the, our hours always just speed by. Um, it's time for our lightning round, panelists. Um, you each have mere seconds to offer one solution. You can address it to hospitals, to clinicians, to laboratory people, to regulators, whoever you like, to make a dent in the problem that we've been discussing. Um, and I'm going to start here again. Well, I mean, I think that, that to, to me, the best solution would be better education and better communication uh, between physicians and patients um, about, about the, you know, what tests we're ordering and why we're ordering them and uh, better communication among physicians about that. So to me, that, that seems to me to be the, the best way to, uh, to address a lot of these problems in the short term. Um, and so I, I think I would, I would favor that. And I would say uh, uh, making sure that all tests out there have been clinically validated and that they're making the appropriate claims so that people are actually making good decisions with them. So as not to repeat what has been said before, to know, to build systems and remunerable positions, to know what the marginal cost or the marginal cost savings is of everything done in the hospital for everything else. Vision? Well, I would come back to the, the teamwork issue. I, I think uh, the tests certainly ought to be reliable. We ought to be able to take that as a given and the rest is communication of how we interact with each other, work together, and with the patients. 
I encourage you all to continue the conversation at the forum's website, which is forumhsph.org. Um, and the forum will have another event um, next Wednesday on climate change and human health. Um, but for now, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.